Sunday, January 21, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a former friend and advisor to Melania Trump. She escaped the East Wing and wrote the New York Times bestseller, Melania and Me, The Rise and Fall of My Friendship with the First Lady. Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thank you for having me, Anthony. It's been a year since we last spoke together on this program, and uh, a lot has happened in that, in that time. Before we talk about you know, Donald Trump, the disgraced former president, and where he's at and support for him, I just want to ask you about the former first lady, because she's largely disappeared from the public eye since they left the Oval Office in 2020. A few public events. She went to the former first lady Rosalind Carter's funeral service in November. She spoke at a naturalization ceremony at the National Archives in December. But she's stayed away from her husband's numerous court appearances. She's avoided joining him on the campaign trail. And also, I mean, her own mother died a few days ago, and the funeral was on Friday, and they left in separate vehicles. I mean, are they even still together? Um, as you know, I, I don't speak with Melania Trump. Um, I haven't spoken with her since uh, December 2018. But after almost two decades of friendship with this woman, um, nothing, in my opinion, has changed between them. You know, I always say it's a transactional marriage because they both did receive what they wanted out of this marriage. She lives her life. He lives his life. And they come together when necessary. And I don't think it matters to them. In fact, I know it doesn't matter to them what anyone thinks about them um, or about the way that they um, treat one another or, um, you know, even the little nuances where, you know, I remember just Valentine's Day. I wanted her so badly to go have dinner with him because I wanted the public to think that they really enjoyed being with one another. Because at the time, I believed they did. It, there is no um, grandstanding as far as the relationship is concerned. It is what it is. They, you know, have what they have because they are so similar to one another. They don't require any more attention from one another. They actually like to live their lives separately from one another. And, um, you know, Melania has been able to almost live in a cocoon with her son, Baron, her mother, may she rest in peace, her father. Um, and that's really been her, you know, her safety net. And as often I, as I was with Melania, I really barely saw Inez and I did not see her at the funeral, uh, you know, the photographs, which I find to be, you know, again, that's up to them what they decide to do in the privacy of their family. But uh, you know, I really spent a lot of time with her mother and I know a lot about that relationship. And I have to say she was an incredible grandmother to Baron and she really watched over him and she really took care of him. Um, from New York city to Washington, DC, to Mar-a-Lago to Bedminster. I mean, her mother was everywhere. And I think it enabled Melania to forget about the White House, you know, just live her life of luxury as she wished to and be able to be available for Donald when he wanted her. So it's a very transactional relationship. And I suppose what's hard for us to understand is because we're, you know, used to a first family being a, a unit. And obviously the, the, the preceding president, Obama, with, with his family, was such a kind of beautiful nuclear family by the looks of it that we would only therefore expect the next, the next one to kind of be the same. And so I guess it's our expectations that are preventing us from kind of understanding how different relationships actually work. Yes. And I think it's so important when we're speaking about the White House and we're speaking about representing the people of the United States of America. I mean, Melania was never going to be the traditional first lady, nor is she the traditional first wife, um, you know, in this case, third wife. But that being said, you, th there is no norm for them. And when people think, oh, she's going to divorce him and she's going to leave him. And, you know, I've always said never, you know, yeah. and the reality of it all is now that her mother has passed, now that Baron will be 18, I think it will definitely give her more freedom. Um, but she's not going anywhere as far as leaving Donald Trump because she is Melania Trump and they are one in the same. 
if he was to win the election, though, that would pose a problem for her. She does not want to go back into the White House, right? She, she didn't want not. to be there in the first place. Right. So if, and, you know, I'm, I'm touching wood that it doesn't happen here, but just hypothetically, do you think that if he was to win the election and, and get back in the White House, she would go with him? I think she would go with him when she wanted to be there. I think that, unfortunately, we have accepted, not I or you, but the millions of people that consider him a front runner, um, that it doesn't matter what he does, what he doesn't do, and whether Melania is there or not. I mean, here is a man who is, you know, has sexually assaulted, a, you know, women who has openly and publicly spoken so disgracefully about women, who has taken away women's rights. And we expect anything differently from his wife that she should, you know, be supportive of women and, and do what is, you know, in anyone else's right mind of traditional first lady and, and an honorary position and honor that with grace and dignity. It's very easy to use words. And that is who Melania is. She can talk about independence. She can talk about grace. She can talk about elegance. They're empty words and they mean nothing. And so were she to become first lady again, knock on wood that she does not, because it would be the most, I think, tragic thing for our country in so many ways, which I know we'll discuss today, um, giving her that platform to do absolutely positively nothing um, except perhaps, you know, create more controversy and conversations um, or lack thereof. Yeah. That is really what we're looking at because Melania, you know, it, it's not, but it is by design that Melania remains silent. That I know for a fact. We speak about it. We used to speak about it all the time. If she, there is nothing for anyone to report, if she gives no one an interview, there is nothing for anyone to say. And they just regurgitate the same things. Yeah. And remember, her White House bio was created. She lied under oath about, you know, college. I mean, she really is. You know, she's created this mystique about herself. She's an enigma, isn't she? But Maybe she's that's really why not anymore. She's, people are interested. There is no enigma. That's the thing, Anthony. Yeah. There's no enigma. It is a woman who is able to put on her makeup beautifully, who is able to dress elegantly because her husband is willing to spend money on couture clothing. And she has, a, you know, the physique and the beauty to turn heads and smile gracefully and keep her mouth quiet. Yeah. So with that smile and that twinkle in her eye, it's mesmerizing to many people. And unfortunately, they don't realize how vapid she is and that there is nothing else there. And she is and, not going to contribute to society. And she, she also, from the brief, you know, leaks of the telephone calls and various things, she, she's a very right wing character. You know, she, she seems to have quite extremist views, very much in line with her husband and the MAGA Republican Party. A hundred percent. And, but most of Melania's life are talking points. And again, it took me some time to realize that. Right. Um, again, I, I am guilty of being someone who helped create talking points for her about who she is. Um, I believed I was doing it for a friend who couldn't speak English very well and that I was helping portray her in a way that I believe, you know, in, in, in traits that she possessed, um, one on one with me. But what I was doing was creating this falsehood and, and helping her, you know, giving her the ability to continuously um, mislead everyone about her nature and and nurture and neither exist. And and that's a fact because I've had to I mean, I personally had to experience that to understand it. And it took a long time for me to come to terms with it. But I really do hope that um, through my experiences, people will understand and realize that, again, they're just talking points. It's interesting. I, I had a theory uh, recently that I talked about on my, on my other show, Uncovered, which is that as a model, you know, that's what she always wanted to be. She wanted to be a, a top model, a supermodel. And part of the model's craft is to pretend Part of the model's craft is to give the impression that it's hot when it's freezing and stand there in swimwear, right? And to look like you love someone when you're doing a shot with another 100%. person. And and so actually, you know, she does possess just from her, her, her job, the ability to play a character. And it seems to me that, you know, those skills that she learned in, in modeling is something that she continues as the former first lady. Yes, but also, Anthony, again, there's that 
um, people believe she was a supermodel, right? right? She was only on the cover of Vogue ever because she was marrying Donald Trump. Right. Before that, she had a camel ad. She was on cover of Maxim. Um, she did a few other modeling jobs. Those, that was it. I mean, there, yeah. I, I mean, I have a list and, and it's, and it's, and it's not what has been portrayed as this supermodel. And like I said, that transactional marriage for Donald was he was able to say now that he was able to get, ask Anna Winter to put her on the cover of Vogue for that marriage in an exclusive was enabling him to say, I married a supermodel. And what it gave her was that cover that she's never was going to ever get otherwise, in addition to being the first lady of the United States yeah, and, and having and a U.S. citizenship. citizenship. And, I mean, <laughs> that's right. wow. All of, all of the extras. Now, you were working as the director of special events for Vogue magazine, so you yeah. met her before she even married Donald Trump. Yes. So you, you were very much part of the journey. And when you and I spoke a year ago, you know, we talked a lot about your regret and sadness for being drawn into the, the cult of Trump and the fact that, you know, you were given the job to help organize the inauguration. And then they accused you of, of spending money that you didn't have. And there was a whole thing. And then it was, I, I don't want to go back into that section because people can watch the previous episode. But, but I recognize that, you know, you still now, all these years later, have to live with the, the knowledge that you were suckered into that Trump grift and their, their machine that is still ongoing. You know, the insurrection is still ongoing. He's still claiming the election was stolen. He still claims that these, uh, DOJ, um, cases are all witch hunts. I mean, none of this seems to have stopped him. And, and so how, how do you feel having come out of that world? You know, you wrote your book, you did kind of cathartic things that were necessary to kind of come to terms with that. But how do you feel now looking at them and seeing that the grift is ongoing, even since he left the White House? You know, every day I wake up and I go to sleep and Unfortunately, still some of the last thoughts, first thoughts and last thoughts that I have are, I wish that these people would just go away. Um, they destroyed my life. Um, they, yes, I have my family and I'm so grateful, but they destroyed my dignity. They destroyed my, um, my career. They defamed me in ways that were not just financial and social, but, you know, psychologically, physically, I was in the hospital. I mean, I've spoken about that. and. Melania, you know, turns around and says, well, that was your fault, or I hardly knew her or, you know, and people believe that. <clears throat> and they still to this day believe that. And so for me, I look at these women who and men who they've disgraced daily, and I see the pain in their faces. And I realize, you know, I, I commiserate with them. I feel their pain because these the Trumps don't care what they do to ruin your life. And they don't care that the lies still live on. Um, and they allow other people around them to support them in those lies when those other people know the truth as well. And so, you know, I wish so many other people would have the courage to, you know, stand up and say something about what they've witnessed on behalf of others and not be scared to speak up because they're afraid Donald Trump is going to be the president of the United States. If we don't continue to speak up, then what, right? What, what does that mean? And so for me, that pain is still so deep. It's still so raw and it's so real because every time I see them, I know what they did to me when all I did was give all of myself to them. And they were able to truly take away my dignity by lying and Melania Trump was willing to allow the Southern District of New York to send me a grand jury indictment and have me criminally prosecuted for something obviously everyone knows now I had nothing to do with. And then on top of that, use the DOJ to sue me with Jeffrey Clark, which we now know is a part of January 6th. I mean, if that doesn't scream red lights to everyone, I don't know what does. And people that you brought in back then to work with you are still very much part of that group. There are people that have not yet come to their senses about who they're working with. And, and even people that you were criticized for employing in the first place 
are, are, are still involved in, in the Trump grift. Very much so. I mean, the New York Times, you know, referenced certain people that I brought in saying that, you know, I okayed millions of dollars and Donald Trump, quote unquote, was enraged that I brought these individuals in. The fact of the matter is those people are still standing by their side and, you know, helping them to this day, seeing them in the papers, you know, organizing Melania's mother's funeral. I mean, I have to say that hits a chord in me because it's so hurtful that my friends or people that I considered friends that actually understood what happened are still willing to stand by them and smile. And this is not for, you know, at the time I used to say, look, this is Melania. This has nothing to do with Donald. This is, this is for the, this is for the East Wing. This is for the first lady. No, they know she is just like Donald. They know her willingness to lie to get what she needs. And when I say lie, I mean lie. And to personally be able to tell me secretly on those recordings that I have that I did nothing wrong and that, you know, everything I did was legal. And I begged her to say something to the world. Well, all they said to the world was silence that I, I was responsible. And the people today in the forefront whose names are still being mentioned in, you know, January 6th, whether it be Stefan Pazentino or today with you know, the cases that are going on, Boris Epstein. I mean, those are the people I wrote about in my book. They are front and center. They will continue to be front and center. They are forever going to be loyal to these people until the day that Donald Trump and Melania Trump decide they no longer need them. And then it's going to be too late. Like, I never lied. I never spoke. I never spoke out of turn in the sense that, yes, I spoke out of turn all the time. Everyone wanted me gone because I didn't stop talking about the truth. But one thing I know about myself is I have remained true to the facts. And I always told Melania and Donald what I witnessed, what I thought was wrong. And I said it to everyone in the White House and I continue to say it. And so that for me, at least I can go to bed at night knowing that I've never lied to myself and I've never lied to the public about what I know to be true. Isn't it interesting how the people with integrity, and I include yourself and Cassidy Hutchinson, for example, who have managed to cross the Rubicon, come out the other side. Her book was called Enough, and I can understand why. You and her and people like you are the ones who are being criticized, whereas the people that are still grifting, they are just part, still, you know, behind the scenes, benefiting from the Donald Trump machine, the brand. What is the common denominator with those who haven't yet left the fold? Is it money? Is it payments? Is it notoriety? Is it is it the being part of uh, you know a success, an American success story, well, or is it politics? You know, originally it was the American success story. Originally. Some of the people that did join me, they did it for the love of their country. They really did. They said, you know what, we're going to put politics aside. This isn't political with the first lady. And we're going to help you because this is about the United States of America. And so they started out on right footing. Um, and then their, you know, proximity to power uh, was something that they enjoyed more than friendship and, and truth. And so as long as they were going to be protected, you know, it's not the money because in my opinion, because the reality was there was no money. I mean, I wasn't paid to work in the White House. There was no money for me because Ivanka Trump had used it for all of her staff. And I was willing to work for the First Lady for free. And that is why the fact that she had sent the DOJ after me um, and, and, and tried to take my First Amendment rights away and, and retaliate against me for speaking the truth um, was so just great about dishonorable, just disgusting. Um, but at the same time, I think that you know, individuals, you, you can't justify it anymore. There is no justification for standing by them anymore because we all know what they are capable of, not just capable of, we all know what they have done and what they continue to do daily. And so how can you say to yourself, oh, I'm doing this on behalf of the country? No, our country is in disarray and our democracy is literally hanging on by a thread. And if this man gets back into the White House, what frightens me so much frightens so many others that he will never want to leave. And when he says, I will be a dictator, even for just a day, he means it. There, that is no joke. Um, believe them what they say. And that is what I had to learn the hard way. Uh, on the 17th of January, he posted on Truth Social, 
A president of the United States must have full immunity, without which it would be impossible for him or her to properly function. Any mistake, even well intended, would be met with almost certain indictment by the opposing party at term end. Even events that cross the line must fall under total immunity, or it will be years of trauma trying to determine good from bad. There must be certainty. Example, you can't stop police from doing the job of strong and effective crime prevention because you want to guard against the occasional rogue cop or bad apple. Sometimes you just have to live with the great but slightly imperfect. All presidents must have complete and total presidential immunity, or the authority and decisiveness of a president of the United States will be stripped and gone forever. Hopefully, this will be an easy decision. God bless the Supreme Court. I I'm mean, sorry to have to read that in full, but it is that is you know if people don't know what authoritarianism looks like, that's that's it. In a that's nutshell, what it looks it? like. And and last week when his lawyers and he were in the courtroom to say that Navy SEAL Team Six can actually he they believe that they should actually be able to to go and kill his political rivals without any consequences and have immunity from that yeah it, it's it's it, it it to me that alone should raise so many red flags to everyone and i don't care if you are a democrat or republican if you do not vote for a democrat if you do not vote for someone other than donald trump you will never vote again yeah i mean that is really what i feel that we are getting down to yeah. And so you don't like the policies, you don't like the politics, you don't like immigration. There are certain things you don't agree with. OK, I can relate to that. What I can't relate to is that. You're not willing to save your democracy and your and your life and, and your choice as a woman to make those choices for yourself and vote again in four years and then go back to being a Republican or whatever yeah. else you want to be. But once you give Donald Trump that power, he will never relinquish it. And we will forever be turning ourselves into, and I have to tell you, Anthony, so many Republicans that I speak to, they don't understand this. They don't, they say, oh, he never said that. Or what are you talking about? They, they're they not paying attention. People are not realizing the, the magnitude of his words and the realities that will come with them. There are two existential crises in the world right now. One is climate change that Republicans don't care for, don't ever talk about, don't write policy to protect us from. It's, they think it's a Democrat thing. So let's just park that for a moment. But the other crisis for the world is the, the rise of Donald Trump and the rise of fascism in the West. Because as we know, this is not, this is not just about the, the US. I mean, as we speak, you know, Europe, the European Union, NATO are looking to how they can protect themselves and member countries without the United States. After Donald Trump directly said to one of the member hosts, the US, while I'm president, the US will not be there to protect you. He, he is very much in the Vladimir Putin camp, the Kim Jong un camp. He praises them. Camp. He praises them right. daily. Right. And so, that is the crisis that we are facing. It is a choice between democracy and dictatorship. What is it about the Republicans and people you might have come into contact with when you were in the orbit of these characters? What is it about the, the, this blindness to the dangers that affect the country and the world as a result of one man's personality disorder, insecurities, malignant narcissism, all of the things that we now know about him. Is there any consideration for the fact that that is a threat to the world and world peace? Well, I think there are two camps in this. I think that there are those that just follow him blindly and have no idea what's really going on. And I think those people, you know, unfortunately are watching right wing media, uh, yeah. social media, you know, truth social, and they're not realizing the facts of them of really, you know, unfortunately, they're not being educated in a way to understand what's really happening. Um, and then there's the camp that, you know, feels that, hey, he's giving us tax breaks. And hey, he's gonna, you know, make sure that illegal immigrants don't come in. And for those people, that's all they hear, right? It's their their money is going to just continue to fill their coffers. And they're not thinking about middle America and yet middle America isn't thinking about what really Donald Trump is. Yeah. So 
there's this duality. I feel like that that it's a push pull where, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm sure you've seen the Lincoln Project, um, Donald Trump, dic- you know, as a dictator. And I yeah. think that people need to hear that more and more and visually start seeing what it means when he says the things that he says, because he will continue to have tax breaks for the wealthy. He will continue to keep his friends happy in real estate by making sure that the big banks and the re- and realtors and all of those people that were part of his cabinet that were at that funeral yesterday, that, you know, those individuals that actually bought many of his his companies and have protected him from perhaps truths that need to be told, um, will continue to protect him because they're a part of the scheme. They're a part of that inner circle. And so they're, they're literally, they, he has infiltrated so many different industries with so many different partners that he's able to maintain this stronghold on them. And there have been a few of those people that have said, okay, I'm not publicly supporting him. Okay. And the Cokes came out and said, I'm not supporting him, I'm supporting Nikki Haley as, as it's not enough, but at least it's a start. And, you know, but again, the messaging is so off because you have people like Nikki Haley saying, yeah, I'd still support him. You cannot support him. I mean, Donald Trump is going to win the primary in every state, right? There is, there is no doubt. He is so far ahead. But wait, it's, yeah. can I just interrupt for a second? I would, I would love that. And I apologize. It's fine. But I feel so passionate about this, Anthony. The mm-hmm. fact that they use words like he won Iowa in a landslide. Right. You know, yeah. These, these misleading headlines, 50, what was it? 56,000 people voted for him. That is not a landslide. I mean, there's still millions of people in Iowa, like, like Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. He got 50 some odd thousand. They got 20 some odd thousand each. It, it's yes, he won, but it's very the media- small. It's very small numbers. And yet, and you're right. And they all did it. I mean, the BBC did it. The Associated Everyone. Press did it. They gave the impression that this was a huge win. And, and I actually put out a video and called it Donald Trump's false victory. Right. Because, you know, I recognize the fact that the media loves a story. Of course. It doesn't change the fact, though, that, yes. you know, DeSantis is a terrible candidate. Nikki Haley is a terrible candidate. I mean, they're all terrible candidates. As bad as Donald Trump politically, they might not have his personality disorder, but as bad as him because, you know, he he set these policies up whilst he was in office. You know, the idea of closing the border, wanting to shoot immigrants in the in the legs, the separating of, of, of children from their parents. I mean, all of these things that would return, not to mention the, the Muslim ban. I mean, I have no doubt that DeSantis and Haley and anybody else would just enact those policies because... They've become part of, of of Republican policy, but they were made by a man who is insane. They he, were made by a man who was not in his sound and right mind. And yet there is no talk in the media or anywhere of mental illness and the fact that he is unfit and was unfit to serve. And truly, my, and, and my, a narcissist. I mean, yeah. and, you know, I've just learned you know, about, you know, love bombing and, and the way that a narcissist is able to, um, you know, and a cult leader really do brainwash you. And these people are brainwashed. And Dr. Hassan is an amazing individual who has written about this and who speaks about this. And unfortunately, I don't know how you get through to these people because he, Donald Trump is not of right mind at all. Yeah. And you're right. Well, it's the media is complicit. That, that's 100%. the problem. They're, they're complicit because he is box office. He is and, box office show. Yeah. He is the best showman on earth. And yeah. truly, like, he really should just be doing 100 million reality TV shows with Mark yeah. Burnett and continue doing that because the reality of our, our reality is so bad. And our country is in such disarray and the hatred and the crime and, you know, and the vitriol. It, it's, it's, it's gotten to a point where no matter where you turn or no matter who you speak to, you're walking on eggshells and it shouldn't be that way. We have to take a quick pause for our sponsor, but I, I want to come back and, and talk about this notion of, of, of his mental unfitness and also his ownership of the uh, reversal of, the, of Roe v. Wade and, and you know, the fact that he is quite proud of the fact that Very he bad. has a, a national abortion ban. Back in a moment with uh, Stephanie Winston Wolkoff. 
We all hate wasting food. Now, nothing is ever wasted thanks to Lomi. I have a Lomi and it's changed the way I think about my food waste. Lomi transforms my trash into treasure at the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in four hours. There's no rotting food in my garbage and smelling up the kitchen now. I only take the trash out on garbage day. Plus, no more leaky bags. I turn my waste into nutrient-rich loamy earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. All my food scraps, plant clippings and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. And now Lomi's new app lets me track my environmental impact, earn points for every cycle and redeem freebies from Lomi plus other great brands. I learned that food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to landfill, I'm helping do my part for the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use the promo code weekend to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use promo code weekend at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. I'm excited to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink is a meat subscription box company on a mission to fight for the family farm. They're located in rural America, run by an eighth generation female farmer. Their animals are raised humanely, their employees are paid a living wage, and the quality of their product is better than anything you'll find in the store. Moink delivers grass fed and grass finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, because the family farm does it better, and the Moink difference is a difference you can taste. Now, unlike the supermarket, Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops and salmon fillets and much more. Plus, you can cancel your box delivery any time. I personally have struggled in the US to find meat that doesn't have antibiotics in it or hormones added. And finally, I found a place where I can just go and trust that all of those things are taken care of for me. Now, I know that this is the right thing to do. I'm sure you will too. Just keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash weekend right now. And listeners of the show get free ground beef for a year. That's one year of the best ground beef you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. So go to moink, spelt M-O-I-N-K, box.com slash weekend. That's moinkbox.com slash weekend. It's The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis, and we're back with the former First Lady's um, former advisor and former friend, Stephanie Winston Woolcoff, and looking at really the, the kind of political landscape at this, uh, this crossroads in American political history, the, the democracy with Joe Biden versus demagoguery with, with Donald Trump and uh, those in his orbit. Trump boasted, Stephanie, about his role in overturning the constitutional right to abortion recently. He call, called it a miracle. But he also is playing this interesting game because he urged Republicans to take a, a cautious approach when addressing the issue. And I think, you know, he's trying to, this is really, you know, whether or not an outright ban is the right thing. And as you know, he nominated three of the Supreme Court justices who voted to overturn Roe versus Wade. And I think women don't recognize, I mean, but certainly we know from this, this ruling, women don't recognize that they're pregnant after six weeks of pregnancy. And this is the time limit at which some GOP controlled states have sought to, to ban abortion at, at, at just six weeks. And it's really that six week issue that Trump refuses to be drawn on. But, you know, ultimately, he is doing this for votes, right? He doesn't probably doesn't even have this. an opinion, doesn't Right. And this is what I wanted to ask you about him. You know, what is his 
personal position versus what he thinks he needs to say in order to win the presidency back. But Anthony, that is who Donald Trump is. It is whatever it takes to win at the moment, yeah. right? He, it, th this is no different. I mean, if you go back to all of his talk shows in the past, he used to say he believed in abortion. Yeah. I mean, he used to say that, you know, he, he used to say whatever opposite of what he says yeah. now. I mean, he used to be a Democrat. Now he's a Republican. It's, it's whatever is best for Donald Trump. And he's going to toe the line on this because he already successfully, and as you said, constantly claims victory for single-handedly overturning something 50 years later that gave women the right to choose. And not just choose, we're talking about rape, incest, yeah. death. The, the woman, if she's- It's the in, right to live, isn't it? It's the right to live. Yeah. And so denying us that right, denying a mother, who has other children, if she is pregnant and she is having complications, the right to have an abortion, if God forbid something is happening and, and, and she needs to, they're telling her, well, you know what? Your other two kids and your husband, the rest of your family, too bad, you're gonna die because that child that's in you for five weeks is more important than the rest of you, more important than you and your other children. Who has the right to say that about a person? And when women actually, I wish women could actually understand this. I don't think they're realizing the consequences. And then when you have Alina Haba, Donald Trump's lawyer, getting on TV and actually saying, you know, and using uh, Justice Kavanaugh as her, hey, you know, Donald went to bat for Kavanaugh, so he's going to go to, you know, he, I'm sure he's going to show up and go to bat for him. I mean, just because he's going to do it the right way. It is like, who would even think that there is a payback? Our Supreme Court court needs to be neutral. And as we've seen, everything else that's going on with it, all the, again, the controversy there, forget about all of that. Most importantly is a woman's right to live. And within us, we, we don't have too many opportunities in our lifetime if we're sick to be able to say, okay, this will save me, right? It's up to the doctors. It's up to what stage illness you have. Here with, with, with a pregnancy, you know, Donald Trump has taken it to, to such an extreme saying that, that Democrats are saying that, oh, they can give an abortion when the baby's already b born. That is not what they're saying at all. And, and that critique of that to me is so just vile. And the fact again that these women can show up and support a man who says that after, you know, again, there are a lot of stories out there about people in his own family having abortions. So how are people able to justify that this president is doing this because he believes it? No, he doesn't believe anything. He believes what's best for him to win. He has never learned, you know, doing what's best for, for others, or it's, 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 you know, it's not how you, it's not about winning. It's about how you play the game. No, for him, it's only about winning and he doesn't care who he plows over to get there. And it's frightening for women that they should understand that their choice, their choices in life, not just about, I, I believe, not just about abortion, but also the ability to be somewhere and say something with your right of First Amendment speech. He has stifling that. He, his NDAs have shut women down so many times. There's so many women out there that I know wish they could speak up. And, you know, I still have an NDA from the presidential inauguration. I mean, indefinitely. If that is not something that is, again, and everyone's been criminally indicted and gone to jail, and that is something that shows you that the power of this individual, given more power, he will make sure that we have no rights left. And I'm not being like dramatic here. I'm someone who's living it. And I'm someone who's just, you know, I'm talking about things that, you know, mean everything to me as a mother, but also I have the ability to stand up for myself. I have the resources to maintain my lifestyle. Other people, unfortunately, are going to be relying on someone who is lying to them about their choices and then they're going to take everything away from them and criminalize everything because that is all they do. And I'd love to know from you, Anthony, what has Donald Trump done for them? 
We learned recently that so many of these clinics that are in place to help women in 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 dire situations when it comes to their right to choose are actually fake clinics that are set up by the uh, anti-abortion movement to talk women out of it. And it, it's the fact that that is happening. It is so dystopian. It is, it, it is the handmaid's tale because it is of course, the handmaid's tale. so much of this is <clears throat> so much of this is not about the pregnancy. It's about control. It's about men controlling women. It's about, it's about men, invariably, you know, white men, landowners, slave owners. I mean, the, the history hasn't really changed. No. Wanting to control women. For me, that is the tragedy of this, of this story, mm -hmm. because we never really talk about the knock on effect for families and, you know, women having to drive across state lines to, to, to get the health care that they need and, and, or the clinicians who are fearing for their jobs, because if they, you know, take part in an abortion in the wrong state, then they can not just be struck off, but they will also end up in a prison cell. Anthony, I mean, these women This studied, is America, free this is America. America free America. And these women, these women studied to help other people. These doctors, you know, as much as I want to think, oh, the things that I've done in my life mean so much. Yeah. The reality of it all is the people that show up every day, the military, the doctors, the nurses, the practitioners, those are the people that are saving lives every day. Those are the people that matter most because when we don't have our health, we have nothing. Yeah. So it could, you know, cinema, come and go. Public relations comes and goes. Yeah. But life, we only have one life, each of us. Yeah. And so to make these people who have spent their entire career and, 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 and life becoming someone who can make a difference in somebody else's life and now to threaten them after, you know, decades of studying and yeah. the institution of, of, of humanity and the ethical code of conduct to for some man to single-handedly say push you know it's gone yeah. it, 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 or poof you know what is that and why you know yes but they're doing the, it with the teachers as well aren't they you know yes. it's like banning books and then banning teachers and and claiming that you know teachers don't know and parents know a curriculum better than teachers do i mean i have two kids in public school i wouldn't for a second think I knew more than the, the teachers that are qualified and have trained and have experience in these situations. And, and, you know, all of this is rolled into the, the gradual destruction of the United States. Yes. So when we talk and about, yes, right. When we talk about Trump de destroying and, and, you know, the project 2025 is about, you know, deconstructing the administrative state. And that includes the schools, and it certainly includes, you know, the uh, abortion. We, Donald we Trump are, started. Oh, sorry. Well, we're just. I'm just saying that yeah. we are on the world stage because you know the rest of the world is going on, right? There, there, are, there are hundreds of other countries who have their own political history, and they are now starting to look, if they haven't already, at the United States, which they used to look up mm -hmm. to, and now they're looking down on. That is what is changing. That is the danger of Trumpism, is that it, 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 is a, it is an epidemic. It is. And he, if, God, I wish people would understand, he wants people to be illiterate. I mean, yeah. he doesn't want people to be educated in the history of how we got here today. Yeah. If that doesn't speak volumes, we shouldn't be embarrassed as to where we came from. We learned so much. You learn from your mistakes. You make a mistake. I tell my children, you apologize for that mistake. You own that mistake and you try and make it better. How can we be better individuals and better citizens and citizens of this world if we don't know what is right and wrong? If we don't know what came before us or what came after? Like, what are you comparing your life to? Just what you know it to be on digital and social media, right? So how this these people do not want individuals to have the capacity to sit down and have a conversation that is two-sided and where people can come together and realize their differences are actually what makes it so beautiful and what brings them together our differences but, but are should be celebrated the abnormality 
of of not being able to have a conversation. It's it's an abnormal to humanity, and I think that that is really what this this existential crisis is about. You know, you're not just choosing dictatorship versus democracy because people don't really understand what democracy means, like what comes under the umbrella of democracy. Being able to have a conversation that involves all people with all views and have people change their minds and, yes. and, and, and also people who might not sit in that political camp or that political camp, but are somewhere else or have, you know, w w everybody is welcome. And I, I've realized that I guess the difference between Republicans and Democrats is Democrats are say are like, you do you, right. boo, right? Just whatever you would, just don't make me do it. Right. If you if you if you don't believe in abortion, that's fine, but just don't stop me from having an abortion. I mean, but it's it should ironic, go the other but, way but, around too, right? How about yeah. you don't want an abortion? Fine, don't get one. But if yeah. I want one, I yeah. should be allowed to. Yeah. So again, it's it's back. Republicans to the, need abortions too, right? Right. You know, yeah. and again, it, it it's the, the the hypocrisy of it all is what I don't think people understand. And also, you know, back to Project 2025, I mean, when Donald Trump first got into the White House, I will never forget, they were really trying to get, you know, looking to make sure who a mole was or who was an anti-Trumper. I mean, yeah. it was like who's one of the their, leaker. Who's the leaker? He used and to say that, didn't he? Who's the, I'm going to find the leaker. And in, in, invariably, it was literally like he's the people closest to him. Yes, it was. And it's, and it's frightening that this is who is running our, or who ran our country, who has yeah. access to our nuclear codes. And who people are still out there saying, I support this, this man who doesn't want you to choose about anything in life, who doesn't want you to know your rights, who doesn't want you to have an education, who doesn't want you to have the ability to, 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 to speak to someone across the aisle, who or doesn't to, want or to sue anyone. I mean, or, that's also the new one. He and, and be able to kill people and not be held accountable. I yeah. fear the president. Like yeah. I, I, I am, I'm so, um, Listen, he's he's amazing at at creating such chaos all day, every day. The networks, right? It's it's cha-ching for them. The more that they have Donald Trump, the chaos people feed on it. But that's why there's all those crime shows. Go watch a crime show. Our media needs to be held more responsible. And we keep going back to that. But at the same time, no one's pushing back. No. You know, I mean, you have the Dominion lawsuit with Fox News. What had happened after that? All their emails were exposed. We see that they know it was all a lie. They all tried to stop Donald Trump, his own changes son. Nothing. Changes it nothing. Changes nothing. And how is that possible? So that is where I, again, I don't have the information nor the knowledge where I say, how come our Department of Justice can't get more involved? How come, you know, and again, we're, we're, we don't want to get into politics. That's all Donald Trump does is, yeah. is use I mean, it's because he expresses it over and over and over that it's it's Biden's DOJ and it's and it's no, it's not like we've remained the the Democrats have remained so neutral because they're so afraid to appear to be involved that they're allowing the Republicans to get away with all of this. I mean, you want to talk about weaponizing the Department of Justice? We can yes speak about many cases, but I know for a fact like not one Republican would ever want to bring me in. Because I would expose Melania and Donalds in a way that's never been exposed. And that was to shut down my First Amendment right to speak. Yeah. Incidentally, and, I, I think your NDA is null and void now, thanks to Jessica Denson's yes, uh, legal case. Well, so. my, yes, Jessica Denson is amazing. What she has done for the campaign is amazing. My NDA was different because it was a gratuitous service agreement. But what she has done for these people, she doesn't even get enough recognition for that. Agreed. And I Agreed. bless her for being strong enough to make sure that women and men have the right to speak out in a gut if, if they've been under Trump's, you know, um, hold. But I wish it was a little more, I wish it was broader because I still yeah. have my, but my NDA for the White House, you know, I, I motioned to dismiss and it was dismissed because it was ridiculous and ludicrous. But the, and, these NDAs follow people like Donald Trump around, don't they? I mean, you, they, yes. you know, whatever industry he's working in, you want to work in the hotel, you want to, you know, be a bellboy, you still got to sign the NDA. And, and you know, this is, this is the way that, that crooks work. 
Yes. And let me tell you something, Anthony, I can't believe I did what I did, but I have to say, you know, after Melania Trump told me that she was going to, or she was advised by Stefan Pazentino, the White House lawyer at the time, um, that they were going to throw me under the bus basically because there was an investigation into the presidential inauguration committee and that they needed to keep everything quiet and everything I knew was just too much. Yes, that is when I pressed record on Melania Trump and I have an, a year's rec- years worth of recordings of her. And I did that for my protection. And I, you know, am grateful because when you're dealing with people like this and we go back to like the what's right and what's wrong, there's nothing right about recording individuals. But for your own protection, had I not had that, my dear old friend Melania Trump would have allowed me to be in jail. Yeah. Thank God I recorded it. And thank God I have it for my protection because I will continue to, and as I say, I didn't do it to do it as a gotcha moment. I did it to make sure that God forbid, I never even dreamed in a million years that a friend could do this to someone, would would blame me for anything and use me for anything that would ruin and destroy my life, my children's lives. Shocking to me, but thankfully, and, you know, I heard it, other people doing it and I did, I pressed my iPad, like I am grateful. And I didn't release probably about, I mean, you know what I released, I've only released several minutes of it, but 10 hours later, I guarantee you, they don't want to hear it. And so I, I just want to make sure that people understand when they say, oh, how come you didn't speak out? How come you didn't say anything? I always spoke out. I constantly spoke out when you don't have a platform and I'm grateful to you for providing me the ability to speak out loud and and tell my truth. But people don't also understand that the media doesn't give you the not. And and many times it's not because they don't want to sometimes, but there's just not enough time in the day to cover all the news that's going on and everything that's happening. But when they actually really have individuals that could make a difference and actually sit down with those people and say, okay, what is it that you have? What is it that will change people's minds? And what is it that no one's ever known? There's a lot of us that have that. Are they willing to expose that? I know I've been, but no one's knocking on my door, right? So there's that other side to it where it's like, but why? Why does so the, it? So the complicity of the media continues. 100%. But, you know, recording somebody in a situation like that is, it's well reported in abusive relationships, is that when you are constantly gaslit, when you recognize that you are not making any ground because of the gaslighting and because of the, the, the emotional abuse that people invariably do turn to anything that can give them peace of mind and safety, i.e. the record button, because you worried that you are going mad. I- and so you think, I, I need to know that this is really happening. I need to be able to play this back. I need somebody else to witness this. And so it becomes an act of desperation. Yes, and, and it was. I, and I recognize that. And, and I appreciate that. And yes, it was an act of desperation. And I have to tell you, when you have people like Boris Epstein, who's still front and center, telling me I should go back to New York because I'm crazy, because I was standing there crying, saying, you can't believe what I just saw, or what I witnessed, or what I heard. They don't want you to open your mouth. They want you to remain silent. And so I, I don't feel guilty for doing it. I just, I wish I didn't have to have recorded. But again, I have maintained the fact that, you know, people ask me about Melania's mother or Baron or things. She and I spoke about everything. I mean, I'm talking about hours of conversations. It's nobody's business. Those are personal conversations. But when it comes down to facts about what she knows, how, who other, who other individuals that were involved that she knows about, and the fact that she had details down to the, literally to the penny, that matters. And it matters because it kept me out of jail, but it also put me into five different investigations. And I also tell you, it's very disheartening that the Trumps have only had to pay a fine in so many of these investigations because my life had been entrenched in being a lead witness against them. And after all those years and after all that work, the Southern District got shut down. The New York Attorney General for the District of Columbia got paid off, you know, I mean, accepted a fee, not get, excuse me, not didn't get paid off. They accepted um, a fee from Donald Trump to, to, you know, relinquish the, the lawsuit. Yeah. I mean, all of these things, it's, it's, um, 
as, 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 as a private person, you go, oh my God, if the public only knew and they're not reading the depositions and they're not reading the motions for dismissals and they're not understanding at all. And I just have to keep speaking up and speaking out and hoping that more people do understand the fact that the Trumps are grifters and that they will continue to do this and that they've been able to just pay their way out of everything. And, and they know that. Millions. I mean, that's, know you that. know, they go into things knowing that that is probably going to be the outcome. This might yep. cost me, but at least I will win. And it's about winning at all costs. And I don't know about you, but I have started to feel like the American justice system is, it's a bit of an oxymoron, actually, because it, there there is more injustice than justice when it comes to white collar crime and the kind of, I mean, look, 91 charges, these four indictments, aside from the rape trial, which has become a, defini- uh, a defamation trial, the stealing of classified documents, the, the dodgy business dealings in New York. I mean, so much of more of, of this is to come. And yet, yes. it really well, looks like Trump is slipping through the fingers of justice, that there isn't really a, a precedent in place for somebody like him who has abused the most powerful office in the land. And people seem to have more respect for the office of president and therefore for the disgraced former president than they do for criminal justice. He is a criminal. He is just a crook. And yet, because he wears the badge and because he has the, the, you know, the tenure behind him, I think he it's now is he immune. Speaks, I think it's because he speaks the loudest, he rambles the most, and he has got the support of individuals who played in that sandbox that they shouldn't yeah. have. And so they are crimin- would be criminally indicted with him. And so that's how he keeps himself safe. He makes sure that everyone's little sticky fingers that are okay with injustice are part of his little squad. And again, where are the General Flynn's? Where yeah. are the Millies? Where, where, I, I know it's hard, but I'm doing it. Where are you at a time that we need you so badly and so desperately to speak out? And I know they've tried, but we need more individuals who witnessed yes. the corruption. Well, Mark, Mark Milley prevented World War III, so yes. you know, we've got to give him credit for oh, that. And, and yet, I do. And Donald yet, Trump has promised to investigate him and arrest him. If he and gets he will back into office. believe and, him and he will. when he says that. Believe yeah. him, and that is the, again the most frightening thing to me. Where people think, "Oh, he's not going to do." These are not just uh, empty he's going to do everything threats. he says. Yeah, he is including going- arresting anybody who has reported negatively on him, including journalists. He'll follow Everyone. through on the you know press being the enemy of the people, and and yet it, he's walking around walking free. Yeah. Oh, how. But, but to my mind, he he will walk free, he will secure the nomination, and he will probably lose the election, but then claim that it was stolen Breaking from stolen. him. Hundred percent. already so starting we are, we're going to find ourselves in exactly the same place in November as we did in 2019, 2020. But and I do believe be, he will lose it. I do believe yeah. he will lose the election, rightfully so, and regardless of what he says, it will be down to the ballots and it'll be up to the people and yeah. he will lose. And at that point in time, I think that I'm praying there is a shift, but. Yeah. Well, he won't go quietly. And that's the thing. No. And, and, you know, you know him, I mean, winning is all that matters. I mean, I don't even sense he wants to be the president again, but he wants to be able to pardon himself. He wants to that's be it. able, he, it's the retribution. It's going after the individuals that have wronged him. He, you know, he, he wants to, I mean, excuse my explicit language, but he literally wants to lynch Letitia James. Yes. You know, he is so offended that black women are coming after him. I mean, because, what he has said about Fannie Willis and Letitia James is yeah, it's, just it's, abominable. And even that, there's no crime. Nope. You see, because this whole First Amendment free speech, I mean, wh- where I'm from, we don't have First Amendment free speech. Hate speech is not free speech. And you will be arrested, investigated, arrested, and tried for hate speech if it has caused someone else harm. And, 
you know, I'm good with that. I, I don't 100%. think that these days free speech as is works anymore because right. people don't have any social graces anymore, any limits. No, they don't. They don't. We, you know, we used to. Society was more, you know, people used to eat with a knife and fork. Now they use uh, their fingers. I mean, no, but, they, but Anthony, seriously, think about it. Look at Mike Pence. I mean, he yeah. sat by and to hang Mike Pence. Yeah. I mean, this is not a, I don't know where these people's minds are at thinking that this is not the reality. But that is the leverage that Donald Trump has over people. That is why people don't want to cross him. And I think that, you know, even Mike Pence, who is a terrible person, the whitest man in America, I always call him, is a coward. He didn't do he anything did. special on, on January 6th other than he just did his job. Yes. And, and so, you know, we, we really are in a place now where up is down and left is right. And, you know, we're, we're living in, in, the, in the upside down, to, to well, coin a phrase. I just hope Jack Smith has the facts and the evidence that he needs yeah. to, to properly um, hold Donald Trump accountable and that our court systems and the people that are in charge that Donald Trump has placed there that have doing and continue to do his dirty deeds for him to make sure that everything's postponed and whatnot. Um, I, I, I mean, I drew, I, I continue to pray that he is held accountable. He, he must be, he must be Anthony. I, I, I don't even know what else to say. I, I, I think you're right about Jack Smith though, because you know, he's very smart and he plays his cards close to his chest and I think that he has material. I think a lot of this is going to come down to Mark Milley's cell phone, you know, and the, right, right. the, 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 the text messages and the data that is on there because he was very much the, the nucleus for a lot of the, this drama. Um, listen, we have to take another quick break, but I want to come back and talk about women and, and how the world might be different if, if, if the women were in charge, because I feel like this might be our savior. Well, this might be the solution to everything, Stephanie. We'll, I, I mean, seriously, right? Michelle Obama, I'm ready for you to come out and go. <laughs> yeah, if only she was too. Right? Okay, we'll, we'll come back okay. in just a moment here on The Weekend Show. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have a family that you want to be able to spend as much time with as possible, is so important. We could all benefit from heart healthy energy, and one of the best ways to get some is by supporting your blood pressure and circulation. Superbeats Heart Chews are an easy and convenient way to support healthy blood pressure. They're plant based and stimulant free, so you get a green boost without the jitters. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Superbeats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. Superbeats Heart Chews are incredibly delicious and so much better than any alternative supplements out there. I take my Superbeats Heart Chews each morning. It's really kick-started my morning routine. After taking my Superbeats Heart Chews, I feel like I have more energy and I'm ready to take on the day. Superbeats is the number one doctor, pharmacist and cardiologist recommended beat brand for cardiovascular health support. It's blood pressure support that you can trust. Superbeats Heart Chews support healthy circulation, so you not only get blood pressure support, you also get productive heart-healthy energy without the crash. Double your potential with Superbeats Heart Chews. Get a free 30-day supply of Superbeats Heart Chews and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 by going to weekendbeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at weekendbeats.com. We're back on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, 14 US states have enforced total abortion bans, seven more restricting access under limits that would have been unconstitutional under Roe versus Wade. We've talked about Donald Trump owning um, abortion and the, the claim that, you know, he is very proud of the fact that he reversed 50 years of precedent. And that's his to own. And in my view, that was part of the reason why Donald Trump will not win the election. That is part of the reason why the Republicans did so badly at the midterms because no woman in their right mind would vote for a party and certainly a man who wants to control women 
in this way. And we've, we've talked a little about that. But, but women are potentially the key not just to this election, but to the safety and security of the United States going forward. I mean, in the, in the, of the Fortune 500 CEOs, women made up just 10.6% of them last year. Um, and yet research shows that companies with more women on their boards outperform those than those without by significant margin. And organizations with greater gender, di gender diversity among senior leaders are more profitable. It, and you know, the, the evidence is clear. And yet America still seems to be so far behind the rest of the world when it comes to equality, both in terms of gender and race and minority groups. And it, how do you feel about that as a, as a woman, but also a woman in business? Where, you know, how comfortable are you with the, the progress that the U.S. has made? Under Donald Trump, we have deflated any women's possibility of being where they should be. I mean, this is a man who lives his life to put women down day in and day out. Yeah. People in his cabinet, except for his daughter, he creates nicknames and it's the most dis disgusting way to display any protocol what's he has no protocol yeah. so i feel he that he hates it, women basically. he hates women he yeah. basically hates women and the men around him also hate women because you cannot surround yourself with individuals who feel strongly about a woman's opinion a woman brings so much more to the table as far as social emotional intelligence the ability to have a conversation and empathize with you and realize that you know what there's so much i don't know and there is so much I don't know, and I would love to learn from you on that. But there's so much that I do know that I feel I know I've been impactful in my life in different organizations that I have wisdom on on conversations and, and topics that have to do with children's rights, children's issues, things that I, I am so passionate about. Now, they've silenced so many of us by trying to destroy us and our reputations that it's unfortunate because so much of giving back and so much of doing what we do, so many of these women have, you know, we've taken a back seat to adding and contributing to our society and in a way that we could make a difference in those specific areas. And we spend, I spend my time day in and day out speaking up and speaking out and working with prosecutors and journalists and people so they understand what catastrophe awaits us with this possible president and his and his wife. And so, you know, it's it's a misguided, unfortunate, misfortunate um, use of of women's time and energy where we could be doing so much more and working with so many more think tanks and individuals to make the world a better place. But instead, we're trying to protect the rights that we've so, you know, didn't even think we had to think about. Yeah. Um, and now that's what we do all day, every day is fight for the right to to make a choice as opposed to, OK, that's our choice. And now let's try and help, you know, the most vulnerable among us, our children. And how do we teach them and educate them for a better and prosperous in, in, in world? So we're stuck in this in this hold also where um it, I mean, I know I'm stifled. I know some of my friends that, you know, we tried to make a difference during the Trump presidency and we couldn't because of the circumstances, but they've made sure to silence women who have had voices, who do have an impact. And that is why Melania Trump also is a silent, you know, complicit. She's playing face. her role. She knows what, her role. where her place is. In that, in the, in the cast of characters, a hundred percent. And her place is to show up by his side with a beautiful yeah. hairdo and makeup and a beautiful dress, and that's it. And so, but we've we've seen it with his lawyers. I mean, Alina Hubber, who oh. we mentioned briefly. I mean, she, you know, they, they were all very beautiful. These women, they present very well. I think it's I'm learning casting. that this is this is like a Republican thing, though, isn't it? To be very, it's you know, right out of central casting. It no right, joke to present in a way where you are coiffured and you are. You are turned out in such a way to look good for your man. I've heard right. that out of Marjorie Taylor Greene's mouth. But now Donald Trump has lost so many of his decent lawyers. Nobody wants to work with him and they recognize that cases aren't winnable. 
And so it's left to the eye candy to have to kind of take these jobs. And we've discovered, not that we needed help with this, that Alina Harbour is totally unqualified. She didn't know how to present these cases. She didn't know how to present evidence. And so much of what she was saying, the judge had to say, look, this is not how we do it in court. And but she admitted, she was asked, would you rather be beautiful or smart? And she said, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, but really? That's not helping the cause no. for improving the the ratio. And, I mean, I was it's thinking so about... Demeaning. I was thinking it's about, so demeaning. I was thinking about diplomats. You know, um, you know, I know Anthony Blinken is doing a kind of, you know, diplomatic tour of the Middle East at the moment. But I was thinking about that image of... of Trump, when he sat with Angela Merkel in the White House and they, you know, like sitting in facing opposite directions and he had a face like thunder and, she, you know, she put out her hand. He didn't want to shake it. It was awful. And and we saw this with with female uh, leaders. You know, he, he wanted that kind of strong yes. man image. But I was thinking about diplomats and, you know, if a, I'm sure male diplomats coming up against male diplomats would have, a you know, playing a kind of game of peacock. But imagine a female representative going to the, a female representative of another country and how beautifully they would be able to work something out and just I, deal with an issue with no men around. I mean, no, seriously, it, and, but it would Anthony, be so more I, advanced than what the guys would be able to offer. But that is so much what I had hoped when I first went to work for Melania at the White House. Right. I believe that I would bring together this incredible Lincolnian group of women that could make a difference, that could come together and speak on topics and represent the United States and children in ways that, exactly as you're saying, from the heart, but with but with intellect and with wisdom and with understanding. Critical thinking and emotional critical, intelligence. Yes. All of these things. All of these things that, again, you look at the United Nations and it's like, oh my God, same thing. Yeah. Not having those women around the table, not treating them with respect, not understanding that the, their qualifications, or if not more than many of the men that are there, again, is something that Donald Trump has been able to successfully make sure that women are seen as just, again, dress up dolls. Yeah. We are not. And, and, and if women in, in the suburbs, right, you're, you're the soccer mom, you're the, I love all of that too. But at the same time, we have to be able to give back. Like our children are looking to us to see what are we doing as role models for our children. And it's not just the father with the briefcase. You know, as Melania says, oh, Baron was like Donald and he showed up with his briefcase and a suit and a tie. Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. I don't care if you're wearing sneakers and a, it doesn't, it, it, what you're wearing doesn't matter. It's yeah, what you're, you're looking at the doing. You're looking at the wrong stuff. I mean, Trump looking, was asked about Baron recently and he was like, oh yes, you know, he's, he's, he was talking about how tall he was and how, how proud he was of how tall he was. Not it's so right. weird. Like it's, it's just so weird. It's aesthetic. It's all about aesthetic. Yeah. It's not about the individual themselves. It's not about what they have inside. Because these these people are again, when you're talking about a narcissist, a sociopath, yeah. it's, it's empty. they don't care about anybody else. Yeah. Nor do they take the time to get to know the other individual. Yeah. I mean, I know I wish, you know, I had the opportunity and one day I hope I do again. But to be able to sit there with those individuals at the White House, with that power to be able to make an impact with Castle and Aspen Institute and, you know, Tim Shriver and Special Olympics. And I know that there's so much that can be done and bringing all of our worlds of fashion, entertainment and sports together, like the excitement of being able to do that versus like all these lawsuits and sexual lawsuits and men yelling. At, it's like, oh, my God, enough already. Like, haven't, hasn't everyone had enough of this in the workplace? Isn't everyone ready for a little compassion and and and, and, and humanity and, and humanity you know? simple humanity I think about um Letitia James and Forney Willis we've already talked about but there are many others especially black women imagine how hard they had to work to get these roles as attorney generals for oh my example. god attorneys general I should say I mean it is a and, and yet Donald Trump the language that he uses to rubbish these people I mean, you know, he refers to Peekaboo James, which is the most racist thing that anybody could say. And I looked into the origins of that, and it's horrific. And yet, barely a mention 
in the newspapers. No, they don't. They, they literally almost use it as as, as comical. Yeah. A, a, the media sensationalizes. They think it's funny. I mean, his nicknames for these individuals yeah. is is it, it's 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 not, it's it's so hurtful and it is so racist. I mean, he is the big like he is. There are no words to really identify him as. I think one of the worst human beings out there. Yeah. And and what he does daily is put people down to make himself feel better. And I I do. I look at Letitia James. I look at Fonnie Wells. I look at these women with such respect that they compose themselves and they are they stand up and proud and tall. Well, they are they are fierce, but they are yes. also highly evolved. Oh my God! With the- because they've had to become highly evolved so much more than the guys. And, you know, I don't want to stereotype because, of course, there are amazing men and there are yes. amazing men who respect women wholeheartedly and see them as equals. But we're talking about this set of people who really just don't get it. They want to, you know, we talked about The Handmaid's Tale. We, they want to be in the situation where they maintain their role as the senior figure. And I'm learning that Republican women many, not all, want to play this role of this subservience. And we saw this with the interview with um, Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, with his wife next to him, and she was using like a baby voice, like a subservient baby language. And he is a, you know, far-right Christian nationalist who doesn't, you know, he likes to pray away the gay and all sorts of terrible things. And you know, this is the very center of government. And that is my fear that, you know, it's Trump over here, but but the Republican Party has changed. Joe Biden said it's not your grandfather's party anymore. Sure, but it is unrecognizable. They can have no political discourse, no humanity. He bent down to pray in, I mean, on, on the floor, like, yes. Where are we? Yes. We are not we are not a country that is not all, we are all equals. We as individuals and humans are all equals. No one, no Republican, no Democrat is better than either. We need to start coming together and realizing the importance of each individual and what they mean to humanity. And if we do not have some peace and some uh, the ability to understand that our DNA and the construct of our DNA matters to enforce this ability for people to respect one another, then we're going to have a world that Trump wants, which is complete disregard for each and every life. And that is what has happened with Roe yeah, versus the, the value of life has become significantly diminished. I mean, if you, if you consider the fact that we have uh, a, a big problem with mass shootings and school shootings, and yet there is no appetite to fix that, the that AR- says something about the the nation but i also recognize that the media has become entertainment and over yes. 40 years but politics has become sport it is like blood sports and and that is the the tragedy of this american story and i still choose to live in america and i still you know I, I i i look forward to citizenship but i recognize that the the only way to fix at this crossroads is to really put your put all your cards in with Joe Biden because 100%. for all the criticism of him for aging in a certain way and for you know having a speech impediment and all these things that should God never have him. been weaponized never look at, but look how much he loves his wife no look they're... how he talks about Dr Jill Biden at any opportunity so look at the way he him. talks about his his dad the way he talks about his, his late son and the like, way he's sticking by his son now hunter yes. who is in a in a terrible pickle that is what a parent does that is a what a family does, yeah. that is a family and that is the trumps do not have any of that right i was in that inner circle i sat around that dining room table the innermost conversations and i have to tell you there is no relationship like there is no relationship Right. It, 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 it's so um, transactional, but also transferable as far as what can you do for me and what can I do for you? There is no real um, depth 
to their to their time together, nor real meaning to what it means to be feeling the way you do and how can I help you. Um, their time is spent um, again. It, it's 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 not it's selfish, not selfless, and it's unfortunate. And I feel for the youngest of them. Um, and I have to say that um, if we don't come together and realize how important family is, whatever that means to you as, as far as family, we will have nothing left because the it's not about the role that you play in your family. It's about being in a family and whether it's the family you were born into or it's the family you choose, those people are, are the people that will be with you on your last day. And those people will be with you side by side with you through struggle and also through through great times. But if there is no conversation going on and there is no reality going on about your struggles, that's what mental illness leads to if you don't have that open communication. And if we don't have more people understanding that and thinking that it's no big deal and that, oh, you and again, and putting more limits on AR-15s and saying it's just about mental illness, but yet not providing anything to make it better, you know, again, it's, they're just talking points. Again, it's like what Melania Trump is. It's a talking point. I'm independent. I'm confident. I'm beautiful. I'm, yeah. I, life is not a talking point. Life is not a talking point. And we are only on this earth for a certain amount of time. So if you can make a difference today, that difference would be to please vote for Joe Biden because Joe Biden will make sure that four years from now, we will still be a democracy and we will still have the ability to vote and women will still have a right to, to choose. And we will not be put in a position to have to choose our life versus we don't even get to choose our life. I mean, it's it's mind boggling to even say that when you are having an entire family right next to you and they are and these these decisions are being made by men that do not care about women. So women need to understand how important their vote is. And women also need to understand the difference that you're right, that they can make not only in this election, but in everyday life and make a difference in people's lives and outreach to certain people and touch someone's life and make a positive difference. Don't just use words, but a touch and a look and, and being open to a conversation. The men had their chance. Yeah. And look where it got us. Okay. Listen, we have to finish, but I'm so grateful for you and for your time and for your activism. Stephanie Winston Wolkoff, thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. I appreciate everything you do always. And thank you for having me on. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Listen to the five minute news podcast, catch Uncovered on a Wednesday. And join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. <laughs>